I'm like Brother Mike. It's, uh, you know, I understand when it's quiet sometimes. And I know you're tired. I can see it in some of your eyes. You still have sleepies in your eyes. And, uh, but I'm glad you're here. So I don't say that to, uh, in any form. I'm glad that you're here in spite of it all. Psalm 107, in fact, we're here to help and we want the word of the Lord to minister. And so it appears that I'm on the right track anyway. We started last week talking about a, uh, a message. And let's read that text, Psalm 107 and verse 27. Just go ahead and shut the door. Thank you. Psalm 107, 27. The Bible says they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. You may be seated. We're talking about at our wit's end when we come to our wit's end. And really this little phrase that we have read here in verse 27 is simply an extension of the entire chapter. And we went back last week and we were discussing the plight that is serious and that simply is this. Okay, let's get everybody, let's get everybody. That's okay, that's okay. Uh, you know, if other people, it's not so much when other people have to do stuff, but then when everybody's attention goes there. <laughs> that's what, uh, if we could all keep uh, focused up here, when even when there's things going on around us. So uh, I understand things have to take place in individuals, and that doesn't bother me at all. So... But anyway, we were talking about the plight that is serious. And, uh, you know, the psalmist gave us four illustrations. It feels like you're lost in the desert. It feels like that you are locked in a dungeon. It feels like you are lying on your deathbed. It feels like you are lurching on the deep And that's where we found that in verse 27. And then right after he says that, in each case it says, Then they cried unto the Lord. And so that was our next point, a plea that is sincere. Now today in each one of those, though it says, And the Lord heard them, uh, let's just go back to verse 6, and they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. So today we want to talk about the provision that is supernatural. And the Lord delivered them out of their distresses. Can I read the next one in verse 13? Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 19, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. And in verse 28, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. I think the psalmist is wanting us to know that when we come to our wit's end, it doesn't mean that we are at the end. It simply means that we have set up a situation where God is ready to begin and where God is ready to step in supernaturally and do his work. And you see, the need has got to be met 
supernaturally because we understand it cannot be met by us. That's what it means when we come to our wits end. That in spite of the fact that we have exhausted all of our energies, all of our efforts, all of our expenses, yet we have not even dented the situation and neither has it improved for the betterment one iota. And so, you know, we just know that we are coming to the end of the situation. But it is only then and then that God is able to bring us out and to help us. And Lord, I need your help this morning. Amen. (laughs) You will notice then in this supernatural uh, deliverance and provision that in each one of these verses when they found themselves in trouble and they cried unto the Lord. And then it is says in, in verse 6 that the Lord delivered them and then the Lord other things. Now, you may think that these verses are pretty much the same, but really the focus of what we want to talk about, did you catch when we read those verses that he uses four different words? See, if you think God's deliverance is generic and plain vanilla and and you think that God doesn't want to do things in a different and, and in his own way and a personal way for you, Did you notice in verse 6 he said, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Verse 13, he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 19, in the present tense, he saveth them in their distresses. And in verse 28, he brings them out of their distresses. Praise God. Now, the word that is used every time is the word distresses. And yes, you read it right. It's in the plural. I don't need a show of hands, but I think we know that life is not fair. And Murphy's Law will pretty much all the time apply. If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. And you know, if we only had to deal with one distress, one trouble at a time, that would, uh, you know, we we could understand that and that would make it so much easier. But when one distress piles upon the other and it only complicates the circumstance and the situation more. And that's when we feel so weighted down in our distresses and there's nothing that we can do. Aren't you glad that it is in that moment that the Lord is able to come supernaturally and to bring us and to help us and help us and helps us and to deliver us out of our distresses. See if you can identify with this. The word that distresses that is used in each one of these verses, it means a narrow way. It means a tight Spot. Have you ever found yourself in a tight spot? It means cornered. When I was a kid, we used to have to catch chickens. My grandpa, and you know, they, they would go in there, and in those days, you just caught them by hand. You would take a, a coat hanger or wire and bend it. And boy, you could latch on to their legs and catch them and put them in the in their pens. And so, but you know what? When you get down to just the last few in the chicken house, in a pretty good sized chicken house, the best way to get them was get them cornered.
are, are we awake this morning? Okay, we are. I just, I'm just checking again. Boy, Mike, this is, uh, <laughs> I hope you're praying for me. I was praying for you, brother. So, <laughs> but we know what it is to be cornered. It means no way out. It means a helpless situation. But aren't you glad once again that when we find ourselves in a narrow place, in a tight spot, when we are cornered and there's no place to go, that the Bible still tells us that the Lord, along with the temptation, has made a way of escape so that we are able to bear it. So, ah, yeah, the devil wants to get you in a tight spot. He wants to get you in a narrow way, and he wants you to come to your wits end, but the desired end for the devil is you throw up your hands and quit on God, but it is then that the Lord has already made a way of escape for us. If you want to see somebody that's in a tight spot and you don't identify with that, think of the children of Israel. When they were coming out of Egypt and there they came to the Red Sea, the Bible makes it very clear and from what we can gather where they were, there were cliffs on one side of them. It's impassable to cross over. On the other side was a huge concentration of Egyptian soldiers, a large garrison, so you can't go that way. And behind them was Pharaoh in his army, and the Red Sea loomed in front of them. So there's no way forward, no way to the right, no way to the left, and there's no way back. You talk about him then, they were him then. But it's then when God is able to come with a provision that is supernatural and will deliver and bring us out. I'm telling you, God is able to help you in the midst of your distresses. The first, the first word in verse 6 this is what we want to talk about, is that there are various characteristics to this supernatural provision of Almighty God. The first thing that I want to draw to your attention in verse 6 where he said, and he delivered them, is the instancy. The instancy of God's deliverance. How many knows God's able to deliver you in an instant? I mean, just right now. There's sometimes that God, he delivers us over a process. And it all depends on what he's trying to teach us and maybe what the need is and bringing glory and, and being a witness to other individuals. We don't always... Well, very seldom do we know God's way. And, and so we don't understand. But I'm thankful that when there are times that when we have come to our wits in that in a moment's time, in an instant, God is able to deliver. You see, the word here, deliverance, and he delivered them, it literally means, and see if you, some of you Bible scholars can remember this word, it literally means to snatch away, to catch away. It speaks of an instant action of a force that cannot be resisted. happens in a moment's time and nothing is unable to deter or to destroy or to hold it at bay. The reason I said uh, to some of us, do we remember, it's basically, even though here it's in, in the Old Testament, it is basically the same idea of what the Bible talks about, the rapture of the church. 
Now the word rapture is not in the Bible, but that idea and that principle certainly is found. And what the word of God says, that is Paul said in Thessalonians and 4, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. You realize that one of these days the way God is going to ultimately deliver us is snatch us out of here, catch us out of here with a force beyond gravity, with a force beyond the powers of the enemy and the forces that are in the air by the prince of the air, which is the devil. Praise God. God is able to do it and snatch and catch us away. When you refer to that catching away, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he alludes to the fact also of how speedily this deliverance is going to come because he said in the twinkling of an eye. We will not all sleep, he said, but we'll all be changed. And in the twinkling of an eye in the twinkling of an eye that's in a millisecond in a in a moment one of the greatest examples of the instancy of how God is able to deliver us is in a little story that's very familiar and and we have discussed it at length in the past But when Jesus had sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee and he went into the mountain to pray, and as he did, the Bible said that they ran into this horrific storm, ferocious storm, and they thought they were going to die. As they crossed the Sea of Galilee, they, they were on that little ship fighting this storm for nine hours from about 6 in the evening to about 3 o'clock in the morning. And they had only gotten about 2 or 3, 3 and a half miles, which is about halfway across the Sea of Galilee. But then Jesus came walking on the water. And that's where Peter ventured out and he began to sink and the Lord picked him up and, and got in the boat. But here's what I want you to notice. If you were to go to John chapter 6, and I believe it's 21, John chapter 6 and verse 21, I didn't write it down. John, let me turn there to make sure that's it. John 6, 21. Then they willingly received him into the ship. And what's that next word, the next two words? And immediately the ship was at the land whether they went. So here's the principle. What took them nine hours, 12 of them to accomplish Jesus was able to accomplish instantly. Do you realize that you can work the rest of your life trying to figure out and work circumstances out and you'll never be able to accomplish it? But God, when he comes on the scene and his supernatural provision, God is able to do it in an instant. In a moment, in a split second, God is able to bring the answer. Not only is our deliverance and the supernatural provision, not only do we see the instancy of it, but we also see the immensity of it. How big and how huge it is. 
Let me simply put it this way. When God delivers, he completely delivers. God doesn't leave even the minor details unattended to. We talk about that individual as a person of detail. Well, God is a God of detail. He, he always does everything completely, never leaving the minuteness of detail undone or unaccomplished. The Bible says in verse 13, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them in the past, saved them. The word save here, obviously it means to deliver. But here's what I like about it. It talks to, it means to deliver greatly. To deliver literally widely. To deliver widely. And so the immensity of of God's deliverance is so wonderful. We might say that when he delivers us, he delivers us totally. When he saved our soul, the Bible said, and he's able to save us to the uttermost. Hallelujah. To the greatest degree, to the widest swap. You know, the amazing thing about this is this word here, saved wide, is the very opposite of the word distress. Remember we said distress means to be in a tight spot. But when the Lord delivers, he delivers you in a wide way. You see, when God breaks you out of jail, he just doesn't uh, carve a a little hole in the bars or widen them or in the steel back of the cell and you crawl through on your belly for several uh, feet and you finally pop out of a little manhole somewhere outside of the prison. You see, God just doesn't take you through a hole. When God delivers, he blows the whole side of the building out. And you just stand back and watch his wonder and then you just walk out without any dust, any debris, or anything on you. That's how God delivers. I'm excited about that this morning. God is able to deliver. One of the greatest examples of that is the children of Israel. We've already referenced they were in a tight, in a cornered spot. But when the Lord delivered them, we'll get back to the Red Sea. But they ran into a similar situation when they were going to cross the Jordan. Remember the Jordan River was swollen. It was harvest time. And the Bible said that had overflowing. And and it was just a mess to try to, you know, muddy on each side that it was. And, and, uh, but yet God was going to take them through. Now, if you go back there to Joshua and you read about the story, we know that once again that the Lord parted the waters this time as the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant, they stepped into the water. When he did that, the Bible said that the waters that they separated. But in this occasion, the Bible tells us exactly the extent of the separation. He said that the waters were, were stopped all of the way back to the city of Adam. Now, we don't know exactly where the city of Adam is, but from where we can best figure that it is, it says the waters were stopped from the city of Adam all of the way down to the Salt Sea. Now, if you look on a map, that is about a swath of 20 to 25 miles. You know, we see pictures of God just rolled back the waters and and just a few people going through at a time. But I'm telling you, he didn't just carve out a path. 
He didn't deliver them even in a four-state, uh, four, uh, four-lane highway. When God delivers, he takes out the whole county. And he says, this is the swath. This is the deliverance. Ah, uh, yeah, we may be in a tight spot, but when God saves and delivers us, he brings us out in a wide way for his glory. I don't know how your mind works. I think I've been here long enough. You know how my mind works, and then sometimes you're, you're just unable to figure me out altogether. But I was reading this anew and afresh when I thought of this, and, and the Jordan River immediately came to me, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to when God had him to cross the Red Sea. The Bible tells us from numbers, probably around 3 million people that crossed the Red Sea. And so I got out my calculator, and it didn't have enough on my old one, enough numbers. So I began to figure, Brother Mike, I thought, okay, there's 3 million of them. And let's say that there's just a path where only one could cross at a time. And let's say it only took them a minute for each one to cross, which I doubt. I would say it would be longer than that, the average, to get across. Do you know how long it would take 3 million people taking them a minute apiece to get across the Red Sea. You know how long that would take? Almost six years. And the Bible said that they crossed in a night. So how wide do you think the swath was when God opened up the waters? How wide? How wide you and I can't even make a fingerprint in the water. Because one of the things about water is it instantly runs back together. You run your finger through it and by the time you get to the other side of the tub uh, or even one split second past, oh, there's going to be the ripples and there's going to be the waves, but the water has already collapsed back in where you made a slice through it. But who but God can make a swath of a mile or several miles wide and hold the hundreds of thousands of gallons of water up. I'm telling you, I'm simply saying this, the immensity of our deliverance. Uh, you may say, there's no way this can be done. I'm telling you, God is not limited to what he's able to do. He's able to bring supernatural deliverance and provision by the grace and the help of God. Time's getting away from me, but I thought about Peter. Remember when he was in prison? The Bible said he went through the first ward, went through the second ward, came to the final gate. And at each one of these wards, there were gates and there were uh, uh, individuals that were guarding. There were guards at the gate. And the Bible said that the angel simply led him through. He didn't hacksaw his way out. He didn't dig or burrow his way out. He didn't have an accomplice in the prison. But God came supernaturally and simply opened the doors wide so that he could march and walk through in special deliverance that only God is able to provide. I'm talking... I'm talking to us this morning, church, that no matter what the trouble is, no matter what the situation is, God knows how to get us out. And he knows how to get us out immensely and completely and widely and overcomingly. The next thing that I see in this passage is in verse 19. You know, he said, 
He delivered them. He saved them in the past tense. But did you notice in verse 20, it's the same word save, but he puts it in the present tense. He saveth in the King James. He saves them. The instancy, the immediacy, or or, or the uh, immensity, that's what I'm going to now. The immediacy. You say, Pastor, we already talked about that instant. Instant is not the same as immediate. God's able to do things in a moment, but he's able to do it in a moment now. He's able to do it now. He's the God of the now. We said there's times that God takes us through a process. But I'm glad that nothing is too hard for God. And not only can he do it in an instant, but he's able to do it right here this morning. He's able to do it now. And you see, that's what the present tense of this word As it goes back to save, it means to deliver and and to deliver widely. There the focus is upon, you know, the totality of the deliverance. Here in the present tense, the focus is upon the time of the deliverance. You see the difference? Not only can God deliver you totally and widely, but he's able to do it now now the devil comes and whispers in our ear if not shouts in our ear God's left you alone He's God's not even able to do it or God's not going to do it what do you mean devil God can do it right now he can do it before you get out of service tonight or this morning he can do it before you get home he can do it as I speak on this message God is able to do it One of the great examples of the instancy or or the immediacy rather of of God that he's able to do things right now is you remember in John chapter 11 when Lazarus died and Jesus did not go when he first heard that he was sick and such. In fact, he came to his good friend's house Lazarus, when he'd already died and he's already been buried. Mary and Martha, Lazarus's brother or sisters, came out. And Martha was the first one to, to come and talk to the Lord. And she said this, John chapter 6 and 21, she said, Lord, if you had been here, I know that God hears you. He would have never died. She was declaring him as the God of the past. If you'd have been here, she's looking back, if you'd have been here. And Jesus said, don't fear. Your brother will live again. And in verse 24, she says, oh, yeah, I know he'll live again in the resurrection. Now she's looking in the future. She says, Jesus, your Lord, your master of the past, your master of the future. But Jesus in verse 25, when he answered her, the first words out of his lips and out of his mouth was this, I am. didn't get that I am the resurrection and the life he that believes in me though he were dead yet shall he live Martha you declare and believe me as the God of the past you declare and believe me as the God of the future but why can't you not believe and declare me as the God of the present of the now I can do it now. 
And he did do it. Then, in the moment, he did it immediately. I'm going to close. Put you, put you out of your misery or get you out of your misery this morning. I'm going to close. The last word that he uses in verse 28, and he bringeth them out. What does that speak to you? And he brings them out. This speaks to me of the intimacy of our deliverance. Brother Mike Walker, if I were to say, bring me your Sunday school book, it doesn't mean that you throw it to me. It means that you pick it up and you bring it to me. You and the songbook are with each other. The songbook is with Brother Mike. And when the Bible says that he bringeth them out of their distresses, it means that he is right there with you. He doesn't just send you out. And I wish I could preach this morning. I, 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 I just he, he, he doesn't just say, "Okay, I've opened the door. Now you, you're on your own from here." No, every step of the way, he is with us. He brings us. It could even imply and have the implication he carries us. When we have come to the end of our our wits in, it is then that he can carry us and he brings us with him out of the situation. Brings us out. Amen. Brings us. I'm so thankful that not only will we be delivered from our distresses, but God is with us in our distresses even now. And of course, the perfect example of God not just doing it, but being there with, is I'm sure you, most of us have heard of the three fellows, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Did we not throw three into the fiery furnace? But is there not four that is there now and one likened to the Son of God? It is Jesus. He's there in the fire. He's there in the distresses with you. Supernatural provision. He's able to do it in an instant. He's able to do it immensely widely, hugely, completely, totally. He's able to do it now. He's not only the God of the past, the God of the future, but he is the I am, the present, constant, eternal I am. And the intimacy of it is that he's going to bring you with him and he's going to be there through it all. Father, stand if you would. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I need you to work today. 